she's talking to the demoness when they're getting attacked <laughs> and the demoness is like oh we're waiting for the males to save us and so she <laughs> says yeah. i think i just vomited a bit in my mouth <laughs> that was just this is quintessential chris lee cole heroine right there like just, yes i'm not waiting I- for the males to save me everyone and welcome back to Romance and the Monsters. I'm Em. Hi, I'm S. I'm Seth. And this week we read Kiss of a Demon King by Cressley Cole. <laughs> I almost <laughs> forgot her name. Oh my god. <laughs> You're just forgetting names left and That's right. That's me, Marge. Girl, can't forget her name. I know. I'm not proud of myself <laughs> right now. Um, but I have an excuse and it is that I'm very nervous right now because we have not talked about this book. I have made no, my feelings... No kind of clear but kind of not uh last week and, and I, I have and as now well I'm nervous I know because you haven't said anything what who so, both of you oh, <laughs> yeah, no. okay I mean last episode I was pretty vocal about my dislike for the book but yeah. you haven't heard my thoughts after rereading it like after two years I'm scared <laughs> I don't so- I don't know if I want to do this <laughs> Okay, should we so just gonna be okay. rip the band-aid off? Let's just do it. What we know I love it. So what do you guys think? Do you want me to do the synopsis first and then we go into that? No, no, let's just, no. Let's just, let's just we'll do the synopsis. After. She can't March can't handle the few minutes I use to I explain the synopsis. The suspense is killing me, literally. Alright. Did you enjoy it, S? So okay, moments. There were moments that I loved, and then there were moments that I didn't. It wasn't a bad book, but I didn't love it like I thought I would, like Kate's mm. book. I'm trying so. really hard to keep it together. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go, Seth. What about you? Okay. All right. So I think last episode I was pretty vocal about like what like I didn't like this book, and I think I'd given it a two star the first time around. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wasn't really excited to uh, see me going off on a full. No, go here. ahead. Um, so I wasn't, like, too excited to start this book. I was kind of, like, dragging my feet because I was like, ugh, I didn't like this book. I don't want to read it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but this time around, (laughs) did I feel the same way? Did I not? I don't know. (laughs) Tell us. All right. I actually really loved it this time around. (laughs) I'm not even lying. I loved it. Really? It was so good. Oh, my God. My heart. (laughs) (laughs) I might go into cardiac arrest right now. (laughs) How long has it been since the last time you read it? Um, I can check, but I think it's been like about two years. Let me check, but you, it's been a, like a we while. have to say you were pretty rootless the first time around that you read these books. Like I've I've read some of your reviews, and I was like, shut was, up, we don't stuff, talk about them. I was such a bitch. A couple years ago, was not playing around. <laughs> she, she was, no, she was, she was not. <laughs> Like, teenage was stuff. No, it wasn't even... Oh, my gosh. I think I'm a teenager. What the hell? No. I mean, early 20s, Safra. That's not cool. Well, we we love growth on this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, life is all about growth and realizing, you know, things about yourself that might have changed, might have stayed the same. Um, yeah. In this case, I think I grew. <laughs> As a reader, but I, I just really I love this. though that you you're like re-experiencing these books, and sometimes your your you know feelings towards them are pretty much the same, but sometimes they're completely different, and I think that's really cool. Yeah. Okay. So I stand corrected. I read this. I finished this book October twenty sixth, twenty sixteen, and I I'd given it a two point five stars. Bam! <laughs> I was so ruthless. Do you, you want to read your review for it? My review is so bad. It's so bad. Just do it. No, I can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then we could do like a... But basically, what I was talking about was, um, I think I was like, on a whole, like, 
power trip in the sense where, like, I was convinced that some actions that happened with Sabine and Rydstrom, Mm -hmm. like, it wasn't consensual. And, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, her tying him down on the bed. Like, I think little old me, like, 21-year-old me, just was like, yeah, it's not consensual. But, like, reading this book this time around, you realize Rydstrom wanted that. He wanted, like, to be dominated but also to dominate. And, like, it's just, like... Yeah, I mean, like, obviously the situation wasn't consensual, but, like, when he was into it, like, you know. But also, like, it's fine to have darker books, especially in a series that's this long. Like, I appreciated the fact that this book was not as funny. There are barely any mm-hmm. jokes, I, I thought. Yeah. But I liked it. I liked how how it was much more serious, much more dark. Um, yeah. And because it fit the characters, right? Like, yeah. had this book been funny with a character like Sabine... It just wouldn't work. No, it wouldn't. Plus, like, the subject matter. I just, I I really, I loved how different this book is from the other ones. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, usually you have, like, a series that's, like, super dark, and then you have, like, that one random book in the middle that's, like, extra funny, Mm. you know, (laughs) just to get you through it. (laughs) But I thought this was, like, the opposite. Um, But I loved, I fucking loved Sabine as a character. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. And I loved Rystrom, but like Sabine. She was great. Yeah. Her character arc in this one, like we've had, well, semi villains, you know, if you think of like Conrad, I guess. We've had semi villains in this series, but she's like the first villainess where yeah. she actually starts pretty dark and you see her fight her way. Like she's she doesn't want to get like good like she doesn't want to become a better person and she's like fighting Mm -hmm. it but at the same time you're like no girl you're good you're you're getting like you're becoming someone really good right now yeah but the things for me i found with sabine was like she was actually funny too like she was making me laugh quite often and this book did have it was all sarcasm though yeah, yeah, she was a very sarcastic heroine, but also there were still moments where I couldn't stop laughing despite the situation. Yeah. It's just, it's the best trope when you have a villain that's becoming good despite themselves. Like, they do yeah. not want it, but because they're put in a situation and they mm-hmm. start caring about other people. Yes. And I love that in this case, it wasn't just Rystrom. Like, she actually started caring for these people, like the demons. Yeah, and like his kingdom, and and eventually she's like, "Well, fuck, man, <laughs> how did I? How how am I here right now defending these people? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm supposed to that not care about so anyone fun. but myself." And I yeah. I love how she like reluctantly started caring for that little boy puck. Like it was yes. just so funny puck. to me. <laughs> yeah, where she just... grabbed him by the by the belt after he was saved by the dragon. Yeah, and dragged yeah. him. I love that. But he was so in love with her. Yeah, I have a quote about that, which it's kind of early on to, you know, might as well go pull out the quotes, but like, whatever. (laughs) You know Um, what? Just do whatever at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's Rystrom that says, Though she acted as if she didn't care for Puck's company, Rystrom had spied her sit on a bench and pat the space beside her for the boy to sit. He'd also seen her brush Puck's hair out of his eyes. Each time, she seemed uh, to startle herself, glancing around guiltily, as if her kindness was improper. In her old world, it would have been. And I just... My heart. We love a redemption arc. (laughs) But, like, was it a redemption arc? I'm not sure. I... I don't know. I think she, because she, at the end, spoiler, she gets her freedom <laughs> from Amort. Yeah. Um, I think it's, she gets to be her true self. And I think because she was captured, I should probably do the synopsis. Oh, but besides, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> do the synopsis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But let me just finish my thought. But I think it's because she got her freedom, she could be who she was. And because, you know, she was so... Yeah. Um, into it with Amort like she couldn't really escape him no matter what she did she could kill him well no she couldn't kill him but she could like do it her worst to him but like at the end of the day she was still like his prisoner and she had to do whatever he wanted so yeah yeah that's my thought sorry for being really messy this episode so far (laughs) we're we're going back on track blur yeah what is this book about (laughs) 
All right. So people are like, who is who is Sabine? <laughs> who is this book even about? What are you like, talking They're probably about? like, which book is this? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> So, Kiss of a Demon King is Rydstrom and Sabine's book. We know Rydstrom as Cade's brother, the rightful king of um, their demon realm. And Sabine is a sorceress. They called, I think they call them sorcery. Um, anyway, Sorcerai. so she is a kick-ass, badass demon. What, not demon woman, but she has power. She's like a, a sorcerer, but like, I don't even know how to describe her. But anyways, this book starts off with her, I think it was a clever way of doing it. It started off with um, a way of getting Sabine's past and, like, you finding out that, you know, she's actually died a few times. Um, It was a really good way of, like, kind of getting readers to feel something for her that was an instant hatred because in the previous book, in Cade's book, we know that she had captured um, Rydstrom and, you know, she planned to, like, do a lot of stuff to him. Um, So I thought it was a really clever way of getting us to somewhat feel something for her. Anyways, you find out that her and her sister are pretty close. Um, her sister, Lanthe. Um, is that how you say her name? Lanthe? Lanthe, yeah. Lanthe. Um, so she has the power of um, opening portals and also of persuasion. And Sabine has power, like the power of illusion. So she can make you see anything that she wants you to see. Um, anyways, we go off finding out that Sabine has this prophecy to fulfill, which is getting impregnated by Rydstrom, who obviously she's his mate. Um, So she goes about it in a very interesting situation by kidnapping him (laughs) (laughs) and locking him up in his own dungeon, in his own demon realm. As one does. As one does. (laughs) I know, right? He had lost it to Amort, which is, as we find out in the previous book, is the product of um, of the previous vessel. So he is um, the ultimate evil. And he had stolen the kingdom, basically, from Rydstrom. And um, he needs to open up this well of magic in the demon realm. And to do this, he needs to make sure that Sabine, his sister, that he's also, you know, in love with. Oh, Mort, I'm talking about. (laughs) Um, He decides. He's so disgusting. He really is. He's creepy. He's He's so They're all his sisters, aren't they? Even even the one who's currently... Yeah, Hetia. Hetia, yeah, is his sister. <sighs> anyways, it's disgusting. But anyways, this kingdom that Amort has built is very ruthless and disgusting and just, you know, it's pretty intense. But anyways, the whole prophecy was that the child of Sabine and Rydstrom will open up the portal, not portal, sorry, the well of magic. Um, and no one knows what it actually holds, but they know that once it opens, it will change the tide of the ex- exception. Um, Rydstrom really does not want to impregnate Sabine because he knows her as, like, the sister of ultimate evil. He knows her as a sister of Amort. Um, and we know our man Rydstrom is very, very honorable and, like, <laughs> is, uh, you know, he sticks and plays by the rules usually. Um so, yeah, the mm-hmm. beginning starts with more of, like, a uh, will they, won't they? Like, will he give in to her body? Will he consummate their mating? Um, so, yeah, that was really interesting. But keep in mind, he was also chained up to a bed. <laughs> I love how S and I are just smiling through it. <laughs> just, because mm-hmm. I know where your mind is going, Marge. I know where it's, I know where it's at right now. <laughs> <laughs> and through all of their um, bed play... We find out that Rydstrom is a very kinky demon. He is. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> yes. What made him kinky, Marge? What did he like? Oh, he was... He, it, girl, he was into the punishments, the spankings. Right. He was into <laughs> the, the chains. He was into pretty much anything under the sun, really. He... he <laughs> I, I, listen... Rydstrom, man. <laughs> like, we he talk- was a shocker. We talked about how this was like a redemption story, if you will, for um, Sabine. But what's interesting is that for Rydstrom, it was like a descent into darkness for the mm-hmm. most part. Like, he, he becomes darker. And even by the end of the book, he's not totally back to himself. And I love that. Like, how circumstances in life sometimes just 
you know, make you a different person and, and you have to change who, or you're so jaded or so, you know, things happen that just change your perspective on things. And yeah, like, I just, I love that. For me though, I took it, um, like his transformation as like, he's finally allowing himself to be who he's meant to be because from the beginning, he's always said that he's wanted a female that fights back. He wanted a yeah. female that, you know, challenges him not only in, like sure. in the bed, but also mm-hmm. in real life. Um, and he's finally allowed himself to have it and have like, you know, a woman that will, you know, someday give him children. Like it's something that he's always wanted, but it's never been something that he thought he could have and not, it wasn't in his end game. His end game was always getting the kingdom and, you know, being righteous and being good. But then he realized, you know what, you know, life isn't black and white. I could be, you know, (laughs) the man that I truly am and also still fight for my kingdom. (laughs) Just live in his best spanking life. <laughs> oh my gosh, the spanking scene killed me. <laughs> For the first time, someone promises a spanking scene and actually delivers. delivers. Thank and you, all, Cressley yeah. Cole. Finally follows through. So thank Jeez. you, Rightroom. How many times is the beginning of this podcast have we been like, you know, yeah. ha- have Seriously. we been told there's going to be a spanking and then it doesn't happen? I don't want to be teased like that. Jeez. I know. There was a lot of teasing, too. Mm-hmm. A lot. Mm-hmm. Um, should I continue with this? No, no yes, yeah, I feel like we went <laughs> off on a tangent. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, anyways, finally we get to see... So I feel like from book one to book, I guess, six. This is book seven. Depending on how we look at it. Look at it. Anyways, so from the books up until this point, we've seen the good side of the war, the good side of the accession, and finally we're kind of looking into the the bad side, like the evil side, um, called the Pravis. Well, but that's because that's why last episode or when we did uh, Dark Desires at Dusk, I said mm-hmm. I feel like this part of the series is sort of opening the world to a different. Oh yeah. Um, era of the series if that makes sense like you feel like it's different now we're going somewhere else um, yeah yeah and and this no, darkness is, is part of it like how much darker it is and how you're really seeing the 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 sorcerers and what they can do and yeah no I, yeah and I think it's really exciting that we're able to see now both sides to it because, yeah, we've only ever seen the Valkyrie. The, the good guys. Somewhat, yeah, the somewhat good vampires. For the light good. Gay, but in- I mean, is anyone really truly really good in this world? I don't no, know. No, I know, like, I know. The ones you root for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but in this one, um, we see creatures that we've never even heard of. Yeah. And, like, they sound gruesome. I have a little synopsis. So this is what the Pravis basically is. Like, um... The most evil beings in the lore were gathered around it. Dozens of breeds, the Neoptera, winged insect-like humanoids. I can't speak, guys. <laughs> Why am I struggling have so? A, have a drink of your <laughs> tea. I was, I was struggling, too, reading my quote. I don't know why. I think it's because, like, it's, I feel like the sentence is never-ending. <laughs> like, it's just, like, insect-like humanoids. Yeah. Okay, anyways, okay, I'll do it. I'm going to read from the beginning this time, because now I'm realizing I'm saying it, and no one knows what it is. Okay. Okay, so the well. That purest power was strewn with grisly body parts. The most evil beings in the lore were gathered around it. Dozens of breeds, the Neoptera, (laughs) winged insect-like humanoids, the Alchemist, eternally old men with long, scraggly green beards, (laughs) the Serunos, ram-headed snakes. Like, just these creatures just sound so, like, disgusting and, like, yeah. otherworldly. Like, okay, I will say the insect, like, humanoids kind of, like, brought me back to another book. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that. Let's not, yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> There's a book we read for the podcast um, that we, <laughs> we won't ever release that episode no. because... <laughs> We were scarred by the book, to be completely honest with you. And it's, um, in case you're curious, it's Strange Love by Anna Geary. Um, an interesting novel. <laughs> it wasn't that it was bad. It was actually really well written and I enjoyed, you know, the overall story. But I just, for me, I was more scarred about how alien <laughs> it was. I mean, I kind of disagree with the story, like. No, I don't know. I think we all said like it kind of dragged. Anyway, this is not the uh, 
Strange Love podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I mean, if you're curious for, like, an interesting, like, out of this world, pun intended, um, you know, type of story, then maybe try it out. But for us, it scarred us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> Back to these anyway. insect looking Humanoids. like people <laughs> yeah but i mean anyway so the whole point of me talking about this was like we finally get to see like different creatures and like what we're what we always read about we always read about the werewolves we always read about the vampires but like now like she's bringing in creatures that i have no idea what they are supposed to look like yeah. and i remember first reading this book trying to search up what they were and i think she kind of like made up these creatures because i have no idea i've never like i can't find anything on them like what they visibly should look like like the demonic angels the reckoners Reckoners? Oh, right, yes. The Reckoners. Those were, I think I mean, those, those were firstly introduced, right? But they were firstly introduced in this book. Because uh, I don't remember those being introduced in this book. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She, they were they were first introduced in this book. She had the she had the zombie look-alike people in the, ne- in, in the previous one as well. I feel like, yeah, she's definitely bringing in, like, newer species that you don't want to brute for. Whereas, like, before it was like, oh, vampires. <laughs> actually but... give me a book with that guy <laughs> no it's like no ew he fucks his sister like let's not <laughs> okay ew no <laughs> he's disgusting and the fact that sabine you know is like his epitome of like perfection and the woman he wants to make his queen yeah she's his sister and sabine is thoroughly disgusted that this man her brother yeah. wants her that way it's i mean and that's that's omort but like the guy from last book what was his name he was he was he was doing a de- the deed with like oh. reanimated bodies like and, and they're Ruth. brothers what the fuck is wrong oh. with this family <laughs> yeah <laughs> what the hell <laughs> they're disgusting i'm sorry like sabine and lanthi are the exception but like everyone yeah. else in this family is disgusting mm-hmm. oh lanthi gets a book huh I snooped oh, around. You... I snooped you around. You did. And she gets a and book did you find out who her man was? Man. The angel god. I'm intrigued. I really want to read. Yeah. You are? What, what are your thoughts about the Reckners? They were interesting. I don't have many thoughts other than yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my I want to know more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I was intrigued because I, I, I read the blurb and it sounded like childhood friends turned enemies turned mm. lovers which is a great trope i don't like childhood friends but like if it if they turn enemies and then lovers i'm i'm good with it so okay uh, yes you'll get that in that book for sure i remember that book <laughs> can we talk about the fact that lothair makes a comeback in this one he's been um, gone yes, for and like eight books <laughs> you're getting actual dialogue i know he's like actually in the plot <laughs> what are your thoughts tell me I'm intrigued. I want I want to know more. I ended up, you know how um, we have our list at the end to rate everybody? Oh, yeah. So instead of putting Lackley, I ended up putting Lothair. <laughs> and I went over, I was like, oh my god, wrong, wrong guy. Oh, shit, I didn't do my list. I know, I was trying to do it as you were talking, Marge, and then I realized I needed to pay attention. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> She's like, fuck what she said. <laughs> These men are more important. <laughs> yeah. Ranking these people, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. You're right. You're right. I'm not even mad. Um, Lothair, I don't know. He's still he's still a very intri- intriguing character. I was kind of surprised to see him mm-hmm. come back in this book. I wasn't expecting... I, I don't know if it was mentioned before in the series that he was... He had, like... He'd become, like, allies with um, Omar. Was that mentioned before? Um, No. But I think you are always supposed to know that he works for, like, the evil side. Well, I do, I do, okay, here's the thing. I don't know how many sides there are in this war because oh. there's so many species that I I was kind of expecting him to be doing his own thing, which he yeah. is. Like, he technically he is. is. He doesn't give a fuck about Omar. Like, he's just using him. He's doing whatever he can to further himself. Like, he's a manipulator. He's a schemer. He's a planner. Like... This book really cemented him, like, trying to plan things with him, helping Rydstrom and Sabine escape. I wouldn't say that this book um, made him a dark character for me. It just made him a gray character. Like, you see mm-hmm. that he's... Because he ended up helping them, you know, so... But to help himself. Sure, he asked for sure. Anything. But he did do it. Like, that's kind of what I see as a gray character, is someone that will do 
the right thing sometimes for the wrong reasons, you know? Like, he wouldn't have helped them if he didn't think he would get something out of it. Exactly, but that's the wrong reasons. Like, he's not currently on their side of the war. So, like, yeah. I, I think that's interesting, but it definitely makes him gray. Um, yeah, I don't know. Both there. We'll, we'll come back okay. to it. Okay, <laughs> he's pinned up there. I can't wait till you girls get to his book. Man. But this is not just you, though. This is, like, I know a fan favorite, so... I feel like there's more chance of us liking it because so far we've kind of loved different books. I hope. I really hope. Like I'm S excited. Ice's obviously. favorite is the last one, right? The would last you, one. Would you, yeah. You'd say Kate's that's book. still your favorite? Yeah. And Bowen's book. Those two mm. are oh, my that's top right Bowen's now. book was really good. Yeah. I always forget about Bowen. <laughs> no! <laughs> how the hell do you forget about Bowen? He's a werewolf. That's... Girl, get out. <laughs> that's against Wow, him. she sorry. discriminates. Do <laughs> you see that? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> I love Bowen. I know. I did love Bowen, too. I mean, Anyways, I him, but like, what? Oh, my God. We're all over the place. Okay. Back to this book. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyways. Um, so, basically, we also find out. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this already. You're not done with the blurb? <laughs> no, I just wanted to mention this one thing. Okay. The That's main, you know, the main, the like, main climax. Thing. Okay. Um, was just basically, I don't know if I even talked about it, but, like, um, Omort has been feeding Lanthi and Sabine <laughs> poison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this poison, she, they need to get regular doses of it or else they will die. Um, so the whole time that she's with um, Rydstrom, she's trying to get back to Omort so she can get another dose of the poison. Um, but obviously she hasn't told Rydstrom the truth, and Rydstrom just honestly thinks that she just wants to leave him. Um, but, you know, closer to the end of the book, you realize that she's actually going through withdrawals, like she's going to die. And then that's when we realize, you know, that it's it's really bad. <laughs> like the situation is pretty bad. Well, it um, kind of, um, I, I liked the, the addiction aspect of this plot. It was definitely something we haven't seen before in the series. Yeah, um, for sure. However, I did expect it to be I kind of felt like it was like it was it was mentioned in the beginning and then she mm -hmm. would sort of mention it here and there and then suddenly it was like a major problem you know what I mean like we didn't really see symptoms of like oh you're but at the same time I understood it because that's how she explained it it's kind of like suddenly your dose runs out and you need another one like yeah so I I, I didn't like think that was a major issue but I just thought it was kind of weird how it kind of switched on and off sort of I think for in the story um Sabine thought she had longer she thought she had I think at least a month before yeah. she needed another dose mm. so for her it wasn't something that she was constantly thinking about she didn't constantly think oh I'm gonna die tomorrow like she honestly thought she had more time so I think that's why it which is very telling of drugs in general, you know what I mean? Like, as time goes, you need more and more quicker and quicker, so that makes sense mm -hmm. of her still being, like, sort of sort of thinking that she still has more time, but, like, you've been on that thing for long enough that you probably need it a lot quicker. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Oh, I absolutely adored the scene where she wills rides from the dream. And instead of I re I fully expected him expected him to have like a sexual dream, but turns out it's like he's a father and they have a kid know, and like he wakes yeah. up next to her and it's all like lovely yeah, and cuddly it's cute. and I'm like oh my god Rystrom come on now <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was adorable and and completely against like going the other way of what I was ex was expecting from him yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, I think that brings him to, like, you know, you find out what he's actually, like, yearning for in life, and that's, like, a family and a sense of belonging. Like, he's been lonely for, like, over, th like, a thousand years. I think it was 1,500 years he's been alone. And, yeah, it's just, it's so sad that, like, that was the one thing he desired most, but he thought he could never get it. Yeah, and it's like he knew that he would find that with her. He just had to persevere. Yeah. And he also, like, reached his lowest point where he really thought that he could only have that with her. And if she, does, if she doesn't want it, then, you know, he does, he won't, it's not in the cards for him. And it's so sad. You know what scene really broke me and I was really sad was when he came into the room all quiet after she tried to escape to go to Atlanthe. 
to go back to Amort. Um, and then he tells her to just go. Like, he's giving up. And, like, it was so depressing because, like, you know how much he wanted that, like, how much he needed that family. And also for Sabine, she's never really had someone that wanted her. Like, you know, just didn't, like, wanted her in, like, their life. And she thought she could possibly have that with Rydstrom. And she didn't want him to give up on her. Like, who wants that? Who wants to be given up on? And, like, that was sad. Well, (laughs) like, it broke my heart. That and then for Sabine when she's you know feeling the the effects of of withdrawal and like she's she's literally crawling on the floor to get to the sword because she knows he's going to fight Omar and she can't go or like whatever and she's I was like oh my god she's crawling on the floor to get to it because she knows he's gonna die he's about to sacrifice himself and she's like no oh my god (sighs) that was just great for a character development if I feel like that's the the, that's the um, the peak for her where you know okay she's yeah she's fully turned now (laughs) it's not even that she was fully turned it's like she finally fully let herself feel something and feel vulnerable and 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 she's she's selfless you know what i mean in the sense that she was she was doing this for him not like she had no thoughts of herself in fact she was suffering in that moment and still she was crawling for him so and then look at nyx coming in clutch like this girl has her (laughs) shot of adrenaline ready to go nyx (laughs) she's still my favorite um as you had said that you like this book in parts like, oh, yeah. wh- what did you like about it and what did yeah. you not like about it? We are so messy this episode. Wow. I know, Mark. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so uh, we're at our most chaotic yet, part yeah. two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, S. Okay. Um, so the things that I liked, I liked the relationship, but there were parts where the teasing, I feel like it kind of went overboard sometimes. Well, they were um, edging each other to the point yeah. of no return. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, the part where he where he hurts her where he kind of just kind of lets himself go and go all demonic and like he hurts her like she's actually hurt and like it was her oh, first when time she's she losing her virgin. virginity yeah, yeah. i kind of went know. a little bit different he didn't know she was a I know, virgin he didn't know. and she didn't say no yeah she didn't and like the she way didn't. she made him believe that she's like slept with anyone yeah, and, and he felt really bad afterwards he was like why didn't you tell tell me like i never would have done this but also, he did warn her. Like, he did say, when when we go demonic, like... It's pretty bad. <laughs> it is bad. Like, it was yeah. bad even for... Um, what's his name? Cade. Cade. It was bad even for Cade. And then the relationship with Cade and, and Rydstrom. Yeah, and, and it got me thinking with... I remember, I think it was you, Marge, that mentioned that it has to do with, like, perspectives. Mm-hmm. And how... Cade was thinking a certain way and I was kind of against Rightstrom in the last book. Yeah. And I got mm-hmm. to see all of that, you know, with with the way that he kept blaming Cade yeah. for losing the kingdom. You know? Yeah. And then it took him a it, it took him a while for him to kind of realize like it wasn't really his fault. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like he had to come to terms with that. And I, I love that Sab- Sabine played a big role in that in making him understand he was going to die had he gone mm-hmm. no matter yeah, he would have no died they were waiting for him so the fact he didn't go and then you would have lost not just your kingdom but your brother as well like mm-hmm. it's actually a good thing he didn't go and and i like that it it wasn't you know that it took him a while like he he it took him a while in the book to actually realize that and come to terms with it and like for him yeah I think it took him a while to like come to terms with it but he also had always said he never hated Kate oh and he like he loved and like I think when he says I love you he even says I yeah yeah yeah, I know I have it saved but it's like (laughs) I'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) no I love I loved Rydstrom in that moment but for me it was like yeah he never hated Kate but like he let Kate believe that he hated him and, like, it's honestly, obviously, yeah, of course, you know, it was yeah. because he felt guilty, um, you know, that that happened. And also, like, I feel like that was a driving force for Cade because he wanted his brother. He wanted to have a relationship with his brother. But, like, at the cost of his female, that's what happened. And, like, 
you know, Rydstrom in this book, he realizes the struggle that he put his own brother in with, like, you know, making Cade having to give up his own female. And Rydstrom even says himself, he's not strong enough to do that. He would never be able to do that. But, like, for me, it was that, that misunderstanding that, Cade, I don't hate you, but I'm not going to say that to you until, like, you, you know, we talk about it. But, like, I'm not explaining it well, but, like... <laughs> I, I get it. I get what you mean. I didn't like that he let that misunderstanding be the driving force of their fight for their kingdom. Oh, another thing that I kind of, that it, like, that bugged me was what? when um, they were out camping, and I think it was after their bath in the river, and he ended up throwing her her head thing, and I think, like, her, her thing headdress. that protected her neck, her neck. He threw it out, and I, I hated him for that, because that was something that that protected her you know that was that was kind of like a. but then once he realized that she actually worshipped the gold and it was important yeah. to her he hated himself for doing it and promised in his head not to her that he would buy her all the gold that she could ever yeah. want but that moment where he threw it out i was just like you asshole and he's like you're gonna depend on me basically to protect you yeah and, yeah well yeah that was, and, like, that that was a moment right there where i'm just like no right Strom. No. Yeah, and Sabine was such a strong character, and she never depended on another soul, like maybe her sister, but that was it. And like for him to put that on her was seriously awful. Well, heck, <laughs> there's a part where um, she's talking to the demoness when they're getting attacked, <laughs> and, and the demoness is like, oh, we're waiting for the males to save us. And Sabine <laughs> says, yeah. I think I just vomited a bit in my mouth. <laughs> just this is quintessential chris lee cole heroine right there like just, yes uh, i'm not waiting I, for the males to save me when she mentions too that i think when what's her name the demoness i, I don't know the, her dorinda name. dorinda dorinda when she tells a little boy puck like you shouldn't fight and you know and he's like don't listen to her like you yeah. have to fight you have to learn how to fight to defend yourself yeah. And it's true. Yeah. No, and I love that Cressley Cole put that in there in the story because I feel like we're so used to her heroines being so strong and being so, you know, um, fight for themselves type of woman. And, like, I love that she's got to see that not all women are like that. And, you know, people live pretty interesting lives. And I love that she stuck to her guns. And, like, we're telling people, you know what? Like, fight for yourself. Fight for who you are. Fight for what you want in life. And like you said, she told Puck to do that. Obviously, Puck didn't understand her. Um, but she, like, she kept to herself. What also killed me, though, was when they put her in, like, a dress and skirt. Like, some, like, frilly type of outfit. Like, that was not to be... About the girl wearing pastels? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the sorcery fashion is the best. It sounded so awesome. Like, spikes yes. and diamonds and golds and headdress and just absolutely like awesome. killer eyeliner oh heck yeah like m makeup to the gods and just high heels i don't know she didn't mention high heels but like i was imagining them <laughs> oh yeah same there's uh, no like way that she's wearing girl, thigh that high would boots. kick you dead with the heel of her high heel like she would yeah. literally use her foot and like impale a motherfucker <laughs> that's sabine to a t <laughs> um but can we rewind a little bit because sure. I just want to say that um, when it comes to, like, Rydstrom, like, uh, um, essentially, like, throwing her headdress and, and, and such, I actually mm -hmm. applaud Cressley Cole for having her characters do hateful things to each other sometimes. And it's not like they do it on knowingly, but, like, they do it because they're, they're hurting and mm -hmm. they want to hurt the other. Yeah. And so I just think that that's so realistic because even though we'd like to think we're all good people and we, mm -hmm. we're not like, you know, we wouldn't do that, you know, but we would. Like sometimes yeah. you're just so mad yeah. that you want to hurt the other person. And you want to do the most damage you can yes. to that person. Yes. Like Bowen, Bowen did a couple things too, all right? Like oh, God. <laughs> he did a couple Bowen. things that... Girl, he, he called his he woman did. by another woman's name. All right. Oh, stop. No, my <laughs> While he was climaxing. <laughs> Who does that? Bowen, Bowen. McGree does that. <laughs> okay, I'm back to hating him a little bit. <laughs> Let's take a moment. Just a little. 
So I just, I just really applaud her for that because I feel yeah. like too often you have the the heroes or heroines that are just so squeaky clean, perfect, and it's like, oh, here's a hero that you're supposed to think he's an asshole because I want you to, but like, is he actually doing assholeish things? I don't know. Like he was actually being an yeah. asshole in that moment, and you were supposed mm-hmm. to be like, what the fuck are you doing, Rightstrom? Like you're hurting her, and eventually he pays for it and grovels. So. Yeah, but I think you also need to look at it at this point is like Sabine's done equally as evil things to him oh, yeah. too. And like and I love that there's like that type of balance. Like they both are on equal ground because, mm-hmm. you know, like they both fight for what they want. They're both selfish in those moments. And it's just like it's amazing that Cressy Cole does that. She finds a way, like you said, to write scenes in that feel realistic despite it being such a fantasy paranormal world. Like how would like who would have thought I could relate to a demon? Who would have thought that I could relate to a sorcery, like Sorcerer sorcerer I. woman, <laughs> sorcerer? I, whatever you know, <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> <laughs> and like it's not like it's not like Cressley Cole doesn't acknowledge that, and that the characters themselves don't acknowledge that because Rydstrom literally breaks up with her at one point and says mm-hmm. straight up, "You bring out the worst in me." And that's yes. why I'm I'm breaking up with you because this is bad for both of us and for everyone involved. Yeah. And and she, oh my god! And then she says in her head, she's like, "I wanted him not to give up on me." Yeah. <laughs> Stop. Because like I feel like that's what we ultimately want. We want yeah. someone love that, me like, at you my know, worst. We show our demons to love me at my best. Yes. Be with me along the ride. Yeah. Yes. And in that moment, Sabine's man, the man that she bared her soul to, well, not really, but like the man that saw her at her worst, yeah. didn't want her. And mm-hmm. like, that's so heartbreaking. But obviously, 10 minutes later, he told her, you know, I came back. Like, I, I can't <laughs> give you up. He found her yeah. crying on the sidewalk. I know. Oh, that, that broke my heart. And she's like screaming because she knows her sister is in trouble. And she's like, I'm stuck here and you're gone and you've broken up with me. And now I don't know what to do with myself. It was really dramatic. Dramatic and we love it. <laughs> I know. I love. They were such a dramatic pairing. Oh, like, I yeah. loved it. I yeah, lived for okay. them. Yeah. <laughs> What did you guys think about them as a couple? Because I, I love them. I love, love them, them as a couple. I feel like okay. I feel like this is a case of they could literally only be with each other. No one yes. else. No one else in the world could be with Sabine, and no one else in the world could be with Brystrom. Like they only work together, and they're a chaotic pair to say the least. But like, you know, sometimes like little chaos is fun. <laughs> they're fine for each other. You know. Yeah, like, I honestly don't think, as you said, they could be with anyone else. And um, I'm so mad I didn't save it. But, like, any, do you guys have, like, um, the first page, like, where they have, like, their little quotes? I have it. Is it the little quotes from the beginning? Yeah, that he says about her. Okay, it says, that sorceress might be an evil bitch, but she's my evil bitch. And yeah. I'll have no other. Yeah. Yeah. See, like, ugh, I love them. And I love that he acknowledges the type of person she is. And, like, lets her be. Because I remember pretty early on in the book, he was like, you know what? She can change. I know she's capable of change. But then in the end, he's like, you know what? Screw this. I love my evil sorcery. Also, like, another reason why they're perfect for each other is at the end when he's, like, he reveals that, like, he he fake married her. Like, it, the marriage wasn't real. Oh, yes. Yeah. And he was, he was yeah. so scared that she was going to break because of that. And she's like actually proud <laughs> she's like oh my god you got one on me I'm proud. yeah that I was, was like good. oh my god Sabine. her character was so funny and like just i loved her like, i thought too i thought like like rydstrom she was going to go the route of you know being hurt by what happened yeah. that she wasn't actually his wife but she's like nah she was just angry and i loved it no she wasn't I angry she was like actually proud she was like wow I'm impressed. No. <laughs> I meant like she was angry that he got one on her. Like, oh. and I love that she's like, you know what? I'm proud of you, but like, I'm still gonna hold this over your head. You know, yeah. when I need it. She actually <laughs> reminds me of um, Manon Blackbeak. Did you guys, mm. Did you guys get that feeling from the Throne of Glass series by Sarah? Jones? No, but like, now that you mentioned it, yeah, she's kind of Manon in some ways. Yeah, I could see it. Yeah, no, I never thought about it until you said it, but yeah, yeah. And he's kind of Dorian, <laughs> so 
Like, kind of. So we kind of got Minorian. We kind of did. <laughs> I mean, um, like, I can see that. Oh my gosh, yes, they're both kinky. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, <laughs> he's like a prince with a lost kingdom. And, like, he's got to get his kingdom back. And he's yeah. fighting this war. And, like, it's, it's Minorian, Weird. guys. <laughs> March. I know. I see it. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> I never even thought about that. I actually, I, I like them a lot more. More than I thought, you know, more than I already did. Thanks for that little I mean, I, I have to admit the Dorian thing I only just thought of now, but like the Manon thing I had thought about. Because it's like, she's literally Manon. Anyways. Mm. Minus the amazing uh, deadly nails, but you know. No, she does she have claws. long nails. Yeah, she does. She she had gloves that had claws. See? Yeah. <laughs> See? <laughs> Sarah J. Mass, we all know where you got the inspiration from Manon now. <laughs> um, what did you guys think of, and I feel like that's maybe a controversial thing. I feel like this is the kind of thing that people could either like or hate. And it's the fact that at the end, he doesn't trust her. And so they have this plate or whatever it was like this artifact that if it breaks she's lied like how did you guys feel about the fact that they needed that even at the end it wasn't in the end well towards the end like towards the end 70 yeah. <laughs> percent well yeah i feel like that's when the relationship actually started to be honest i feel like it was necessary in a way no mm-hmm. because they, i think they it kept... was too yeah, yeah. They kept lying to each other, and, and I think they needed that little test to kind of move their relationship forward. I just feel like some people would want him to just be fine with her and just assume that she'll never lie again. And I kind of liked that that's not how it went down. Like, he still had trust issues. Yeah. For re- like, for good reason. Yeah, you know? look like, at how they started off. She yeah. literally abducted him off the street and tied him up and locked him in a dungeon. That will cause trust issues. Like, at the end of the day, I like that they, she gave him that option. Like, she's like, I know you won't trust me. Realistically speaking, I've done some stupid shit and I've done some horrible things to you. You won't trust me. And so here's something that will make you, you know, have that faith in me. You know, you won't see it shatter if I, like, you know, if she lies, it'll shatter. But, you know. I feel like otherwise, this trust issue would have loomed over their relationship. You know, so... The fact that they have that means that they can move forward with their lives and, like, not worry about it. Plus, I'm sure that, like, years down the line, that won't even be, like, an issue anymore. And I wouldn't be surprised if, like, they had some kind of ritual where they take the artifact off the wall and, like, say to hell with it. Like, I trust you. But, like, I don't know. I wouldn't even say it's years I was going to say, it wasn't even going to be years down the line. I'm pretty sure as soon as they got home, they got rid of it. Because, like, I don't know. I feel like they finally, at the end of that book, you know, tore all their walls down and, like, Mm -hmm. exposed themselves fully. And I don't know what else either of them could have done to build that trust. Because, yeah, like, I feel like the covenant, the, you know, the ornament didn't obviously solve their trust issues. He still was trying to keep her past the six days that she had promised him. And, I think he had to slowly, you know, believe that she could want him. And obviously at the end, he finds out when all the walls are down that, you know, a future with Sabine is happening. Like, it's it's their life now. Like, their life together is happening. Yeah, plus when, you, when you've been hurt, you need proof that the other person can't hurt you again in the sense that, like, say people that get cheated on, oftentimes they have trust issues afterwards and they're like, well, I need your phone not to have a password or I need to know yeah. the password of your phone. You know what I mean? And it's kind of it's kind of similar to that. It's like, well, I need this thing that will prove to me that you're not lying because you've been lying to me this this whole time, you know? Yeah. So. And, like, you know, Sabine obviously doesn't come from, like, the most reputable background. Yeah. Um, Do we want to get into um, the monster of the story? Um, I feel like, yeah, we, we should. Let's, okay. let's do it. Who or what is the monster of the story? I think pride is a huge one for both of them, possibly, but definitely Rystrom. Yes. Especially when it comes to the issues with his brother and what happened with mm-hmm. him understanding that 
you know, your kingdom is sometimes not as important as the lives of other people or, I don't know, like, I, I, I think when he was ready to give it up and he was like, brother, you're going to be a great king. Like, I think he was ready to let it go for that to not be him and not his life. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. Please help. <laughs> It, re it reminds me a little bit of that quote where Rydstrom says, um, it goes, Rydstrom would die for his people, why wouldn't Cade on? And yeah. I feel like he put a lot of pressure on on Cade. On I mean, Cade to be like him. Yeah. But the truth is, he's not. No. And I feel like he kind of resented Cade as well. Because he didn't have... I felt like Cade, uh, Rydstrom resented Cade. Mm -hmm. because Kay didn't have the same responsibilities as him mm -hmm. you know he was sent off with his foster family and and Rydstrom even said it he said that he wasn't hard on Kay not because of what happened in the past but because of like the way he was living his life um but I think it also like going back to um Rydstrom telling Cade um you're gonna be king now I think it's again bringing back like the idea with Nikolai and his brothers yeah. um taking away their choice Mm -hmm. taking away like the option that you know you can make your choice you can live the life how you wanted he was telling Cade you know what I'm gonna die I'm giving up the kingdom because Sabine is more important to me you're gonna be king and like he wasn't gonna take any other answer but you know you are the king um and I think like they their re like relationship has so much more to go like it has they have to rebuild I think like it's just a tough situation and I think at the end they've you know they themselves don't really think that you know I don't know how to ex explain it, but, like, for me, like, the way I'm looking at it is, like, I didn't like that he put that ultimatum on Cade. And, like, I think just the idea that choice being taken away is just, I think it's a common theme in this series. But I, we talked about perspectives, and I also think, I don't, I, I don't remember if in Cade's book we know that Rydstrom actually witnessed his entire family dying. Yeah. You know, and that's why Cade was so important to him and why he sent him away and, and, you know, why the kingdom was so important. Because he wasn't supposed to be the heir to begin with. Rydstrom wasn't I know, supposed it was to be the heir. Nelson. Yeah. His brother died and they had sisters that died. So when you say it's like Nikolai, it's exactly like Nikolai. Like, mm -hmm. it's the one that witnesses everyone dying and then is left with the decision, well, what do we do now? Like, how do I protect my people? True. How do I protect yeah. my family from this ever happening again? And I think mm -hmm. in part, this is why Rydstrom was holding on to his kingdom so hard. It's because he saw that happening and he, he just wanted protection for these people, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's at the de detriment of his own family members. But yeah, I think... I think by the end when he made that, like when he was ready to make that sacrifice for Sabine, um, in part, it's, I don't know, like, because he was so selfless, but that was about being selfish for once, you know? True. I never really looked at it that way, but yeah, Rydstrom was really selfless in that point. Um, I mean, up until that point, but he wanted something for himself, but I just like, it's like the whole, like the whole cycle, you know, Rydstrom's own choice was taken away, but yet, you know, he's repeating the cycle with taking away Cades, but obviously, ultimately, that's not the case that didn't happen. Rydstrom got to be the king, um, but I mean, yeah, it's just the, the idea of choice being taken away, I think, is a, it's not even just a common thing in, you know, the series, but I think it's something common in, like, life. I feel like something that's, like, everyone can relate to, like, you're not making your own choices in life. I think that's something a lot of people can relate to. Well, duty is a messy thing, so. Yeah. Um, for a monster that I found, um, for me, I thought the monster Sabine had to face was society. Um, in the sense where, like, she, you know, she's a wanted woman by the Reckners. Like, they want to kill her um, because, like, they obviously kill all um, sorcerai. Is that how you say it, Marge? Yeah. <laughs> 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 but like also she gets saved by Amort and obviously we know that he is you know the ultimate evil but it's also quote unquote like her only family besides obviously Lanthe so like she had to she had to be evil she had to show no weakness but at the same time when she met Rydstrom she obviously had to look at her world in a different light and she had to see that you know it's it, it was a pretty gruesome world and she even says um for some reason, she didn't want him to think just because she lived here, she was like them. 
But she had to put on that facade that, you know, she was evil and that made everyone's perception of her different than who she actually was. So I think for her, her monstrous society. Because Rydstrom is also like, yeah, no, she's too evil. But she actually wasn't. Yeah. Also, probably addiction, though that was forced on her. But I, mm-hmm. I still think that was something that loomed over her. Also, her... Like, she didn't think she deserved happiness. Yeah, I think they both thought that, too. Rydstrom as well. Yeah. And, like, I think it's really sad. Like, I feel like a monster that they mutually faced was loneliness. Lanthi commented on it for Sabine, and then Rydstrom, Sabine noticed it in him. And it's just, like, it's so sad that they both battle loneliness, and, like, they finally find each other. But at what cost? Like, it was just... Yeah, she's, like, the queen of illusions, right? She's constantly shaping the world as she wants it but he says at one point about her he's like you see yourself as an illusion like you don't who are you like who like I don't know like I just thought that was really interesting how I don't know what do you think that means well I think in like her world of like the Pravis of like the world of of Mort and his kingdom it's she had to show that she had no weakness so she started living that way and started believing that that's how she had to live her life to show no weakness And that itself became an illusion. And so for her, like, tearing down her walls, and in her case, tearing down her illusions about herself, you know, removing the uh, the illusion of, like, the white streak, she no longer could hide it. Um, The, you know, the throat slit mark on her neck, she couldn't hide that anymore either. And it's just, like, finally, like, revealing her scars. And that was her first step in revealing her inner scars as well. And I think, yeah, she was living an illusion because she had to. Plus, if you, if you die that many times, wouldn't you start seeing life as an illusion? Yeah. Like, was she living or was she simply surviving? She was only surviving. She was... I don't think she was... She Well, we said, like, she, she didn't feel like she was worth it. She only wanted to save Len- Lenthi. Like, that, that yeah. was her only purpose like just survival and and eventually making it out alive and and free so and I think um Rydstrom kind of hit it on the nail when he kind of told her um like he was thinking and he didn't tell her that like she didn't really value death because Mm -hmm. like she had died so many Mm -hmm. times and I think like it's not that she didn't value death she knew that you know it's inevitable and like yeah she's lived so many like through so many deaths it's just her end goal was protecting her sister and making sure that her sister had a good life. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, like, I think it brings it back to, like, the fear of death. Like, you know, like, Kator and Lord Death. Um, she no longer feared death. And, like, that made her, you know, fearless. Sometimes stupid, but, like, yeah, I just think, you know, fear of death, I think everyone should have, like, should have it, but Sabine kind of didn't. <laughs> And that was another thing that they mentioned that attract Omar to her, right? Was yeah, was the fact that she she kept dying, and he couldn't die. Oh yeah, I think so I remember they did right? on that. And that was probably one of the reasons why he just he was so obsessed with her. Yeah, because she's known what it felt like to die. Yeah, he was such a creep. <laughs> he okay, was. Okay, so so the monster of this story that I think is Omar. Plain and simple, yeah, well, literally. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. He's a monster, but yeah. not the attractive. He's a creepy. Not the kind we want to no. play around with. No. no. And for him, it's like I honestly could not see his side of things. Like you know how, like as readers, we try to see different characters in different lights and try to see them in different perspectives. But for him, I honestly could not see a good side. Like there was well, nothing he's about a him spawn that of evil. I I don't think I you're know. supposed to see his side. No, I know, I know. <laughs> he's like, but there's really... always there's always like uh, Emma's father, right? Like there was he was yeah. evil, but there was oh like he some wasn't type like of... that. Emma's father was gr- more gray, more interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with Omar, there wasn't anything that could be like redeemable, like even a little bit, like because he thing. basically because he was all evil, he didn't really have a conscience he didn't really have anything that would have made him good same with Groot I think Groot and him were both evil but like Groot still had like the idea of he's lonely you know like that was his thing that was driving him to want the vessel to also obviously you know he wants to produce the ultimate evil as well but he was lonely at the end of the day 
Omar, I have no, like, he had, like, he was just evil. No conscience, no goodness, nothing about him. Omar is the embodiment of wrongness. Like, that is, that's yeah. what he is. He's the wrongness in the world. He was produced as such. So, you yeah. know, and, and similarly, a, a child, like, Cade and um, Holly's child will probably be the embodiment of, of goodness. So, They're having twins, so children. Oh, true. That's um, what they said. And then we're going to yeah. read their books, maybe, hopefully. I don't know, crossing hopefully. my fingers. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Immortals After Dark, second generation. <laughs> Book <Coming>. 108. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, wouldn't be bad. Wouldn't be Me bad. Either. Um, I know I'm, like, really, like, random right now, but... So, Krusty Cole's humor in general is just so funny to me and I think like you said earlier on in this episode Marge that um like you didn't find this book that humorous and then I said that I feel like this book was humorous despite the serious situations like one scene that really highlighted that was um when Cade went to find Nyx and then brought her back and like Sabine is literally dying on the bed like coughing up blood like poison is everywhere and like Nyx just comes in and she's like what is going on here? She asked. All Cadian would ever say would say is, "Have you ever wanted to see a scene from The Exorcist in real life?" <laughs> and I'm like, "So, Cade, your sister in law is literally dying from poison, and this is what you decide to wear to Nyx." And I'm like, Ugh. Yeah. "I loved, I loved it. I was laughing despite my stress of the situation." I f- okay, it's not that there were no, it's not that there was no humor in this book. I just thought it was more restrained than the previous book books in mm. a great way in a necessary way yeah yeah i would agree with that Agreed. i think yes this book was more serious and like more heavy mm-hmm. but i think the parts that really had humor in it really shone like yeah. it really shined through for me at least and then also like again with the humor in this you know when she was here i just thought it was so funny like her revulsion with how the women were living yeah and like how he talked about um was her name dorinda yeah and how, like, he's like, I like that she cares about others above herself, he said. I admire that she's noble-minded and virtuous. Sabine gave a scoff. I could be virtuous if I wanted to be. And then in an incredulous tone, he said, you don't know the meaning of virtue. And then she's like, of course I do. It means your thong must be white. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part. That so funny. <laughs> Like, oh and I love that he was just exasperated. He's like, oh my gosh, like, God, give me strength to deal with this yeah. woman. She is so funny. Anyway, I was ready to lose her V card. Mm. <laughs> she was like, please take it from me. <laughs> I know. She was ready. She's waited 500 years. Wow. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> a long time. Imagine, imagine going through like her. Like, your transition. Because remember, it's, like, when you're hyper, you know, like, sensitivity. Like, Like, yeah. Yeah, and you're a horny AF. So imagine going through that and not being able to, you know. And for imagine for the whole world to know and see it because they all know it's going to shatter when she has sex. It's, like, (laughs) Jesus. It's public. And, like, the fact that they're... (laughs) In fact, like, the fact that they're all just waiting in the throne room, too, to see when it falls... Especially Omar, that little creep. Like, he's staring Ew. at it. Like, he is it going to break? And then the second that it freaking breaks, he's like, Bae, <laughs> can we <Ew>. now? <laughs> yeah. Disgusting. <laughs> so creepy. What did you guys think of the fact that they don't adopt Puck? Oh, yeah. I, I expected it to happen. Like, I was waiting for that moment. I kind of wanted them to as well. I was really mad that she didn't a- adopt him. Yeah. But at the same time, like, apparently she sees him as often as she can. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting because you kind of get a sense that um, she wanted it. She wanted to adopt Puck, but Dorinda had, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> was there first. <laughs> Staked her claim on him. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. I thought that was yeah. interesting how you could feel that she was kind of disappointed a little bit. And I was like, oh. But I wish But I also, happened. like, I think she still has a fair, like, a long way to go in terms of, oh, like, yeah. being able to take care of a child. Because, like, she's not, she hasn't really shown the kid affection. 
Can you imagine her with a child? <laughs> she'd be like, here, take born. this little <laughs> thing. She'd be like dangling it by the, the back of the she'd neck, be... like the scruff of the neck. Like, what yeah. is this thing? It stinks. I know. <laughs> Or she'd be like dressing her child in like diamonds and gold, and <laughs> or like she would yeah. forget the diaper needs dress. to be changed, <laughs> <laughs> and she would like not be able to handle like the idea of even like changing a diaper. She'd be like, "Why can't oh, he clean no. up after Ry- himself?" Rystrom is on diaper duty his entire For life. life. All For she eternity. would do, yeah. <laughs> All she would do is just, like, look at the kid and be like, oh, it's not ugly. And then, you know, call it a day. Yeah, she'd be like, the spawn stinks. Do something about it. (laughs) (laughs) It. She'd call it it. Oh, yes. And I love that they even remarked upon it. Oh, my gosh. Another favorite scene when they were in the camp. When, like, um, one of the females, after, like, you know, she saved everyone from the dragon basilisk thing. Yeah. And, like, everyone was coming to her and, like, looking to her as, like, their queen or whatever. And, like, one of the girls asked her to name her horse. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. And she named it. Was it Felicia? Felicia. Felicia. And no one knew what it meant, obviously. But then Rydstrom hears the name. He's like, Sabine! (laughs) What the hell are you doing? Why are you because they don't me? talk? Like, they don't speak the same language, right? So I know, I know. And then known. once they finally hear what it actually meant, like <sighs> Sabine is so funny. She's so rootless in the in the greatest way. All right, time for our favorite part <laughs> of the episode. I feel like like I'm having so much fun. Rage, like I can't speak today. Let me me either. That. <laughs> I'm ready. Time All right. to rank people. Let's go. Who's going first? Dun, dun, dun. I'll go first this time. Okay, go Marge. Okay. Uh, guy or girls? Um, girls first. Okay. Sabine. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> is, surprise. Is my new favorite. Mist. Well, I mean, surprise, surprise. It's kind of a shocker. It's been the same for how many episodes at this point? This, for, is, yeah. this is huge. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sabine Mist. Then I have Katerin and Holly as, like, a tie. Mary Ketta, Emma, Naomi. Yes. Okay, I have uh, Mary Ketta, Holly, Sabine. I have Mist and Katerin the same. And then Emma and then Naomi. <laughs> Our lists are so different. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, number one is Mary Ketta, Sabine. Katerin, Holly, then Mist, then Emma, and then Naomi. Our wow. lists are so different. Yeah. For right, the men. Let's do the guys. Mm-hmm. Rystrom. I'm expecting some... <gasps> I'm putting I, I No, I'm no, literally in shock. Guess. Guess. This Hold on. Guess. Hold on. Wait, I'm not over. I'm not over <laughs> Rystrom taking top place. My shock, you know, held me in place. I... Wait, well, what? listen, the only thing that puts him first is the fact that he's a kinky boy. And that's the only wa- the, the only reason why he gets <laughs> the top place, the, the top spot. Because my boy Nikolai still kinky. has my heart. Okay, Rystrom, Nikolai, Kate, Conrad Bowen, Ty, Sebastian, Lapline. Okay. I just I can't believe Nikolai dropped. All right. <laughs> okay, so for me is Bowen, Katie on. Um, it was supposed to be Lothair, <laughs> but that scratched that off. <laughs> uh, Lack Lane, and then Nikolai, Rydstrom, Conrad, and then Sebastian. I feel like we should right. start doing them from the bottom to the top. <laughs> that way, it's more suspense. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Seth, do okay, yours. We could do that. So um, am I doing it from the no, my do favorite it, do to it my... from the top to the bottom, and we'll do bottom to the next top week? next time. Okay. Yeah. All right. So top spot is still Conrad. Damn. <laughs> Bowen. Um. So this took a little shake up. Wait, week, wait, okay? wait. Us. Where was Wrightstrom in yours? He was one, two, three, four, five, fifth place. Ah. Hold on. Wait, that like did, that did not yeah. register with me. What? <laughs> Hold on. Fifth? Want me to go back and read my list again? Right. Seven? Fifth? Yeah. But you like the kinky, so I'm kind of lost here. I like Nicolai a little bit more than... And Lackline is before him? 
girl, you and the werewolves. She was Team Jacob, everyone. This is why she's yeah. canceled. Her opinion is canceled. <laughs> yeah, I love werewolves. <laughs> Anyways. Seth, your order. Start over. Okay, as you, uh, you know, interrupted me, I'll start from yeah, the sorry, beginning sorry, again. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. I, no, I, didn't even, I didn't even re- register with me that Rydstrom dropped to fifth yeah. on her list. Okay, so Conrad, Bowen, Rydstrom, Cade, Nikolai, Sebastian, and then Lachlan. So my, like, last week, Cade and Bowen were tied for second. Okay. But... This week, I decided to make Rydstrom third, and then Kay dropped to fourth. <gasps> I know. Damn. So we both prefer Rydstrom to Cade, and S yes. doesn't. Yes. Interesting. This is cool, though. <laughs> if we all had, like, the same opinion, I feel like that wouldn't be as fun. And at least this way, we're not fighting over men. Mm. But I will say from now, Lothair is mine. Like, you guys can't even try to fight over it. All right, Lothair is yours until I say otherwise. Ah, no, you know what? <laughs> this is going to cause a fight on our episode, and I don't think our listeners want to hear a fight, so. Maybe, okay, hopefully I'll love the, the Dark Faith more than, than Lothair so that we don't have to fight over him. I'm thinking I'm just going to pull a, um, a Nyx and, and get myself a um, harem. <laughs> right? I mean, like, at this point, there's so many hot males in this world. Why not do that? All right, are we done? Yeah. Nothing else to say? I'm no. sorry, guys. We were such a mess today. <laughs> Hopefully it's because of the enthusiasm. <laughs> Not just because we're messy people. <laughs> or are we? Um, but yeah, this is it for this week. Um, this week's episode of Romance and the Monsters on Kiss of the Demon, Sk- Demon Sky. <laughs> what? <laughs> Demon Rewind. Sky? Do it again. All right, so this is it for this week's episode of <laughs> So. <laughs> Who are you laughing? Right. Don't look at her. Okay, I'm not looking. All right, so this is it for this week's episode of Romance and the Monsters. Um, I hope you enjoyed our discussion of Kiss of a Demon King by Cressley Cole. Um, next week, we are... We don't actually know what we're reading next week, but um, <laughs> make sure to check out our social media to find out um you can find us on both twitter and instagram at no that's not true you can find us find us on instagram at romance of the monsters podcast or twitter at the rtm pod you can also email us if you want to at romance of the monsters podcast at gmail.com and you can find me on both twitter and instagram at foes and lovers and you can find me us on both instagram and twitter at but this book and you can find me, Seth, on both Instagram and Twitter at Pros with Woes. And that's it. That's the end of our episode. <laughs> All right. Well, goodbye, I guess. Bye. See you next time. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>